I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa Fittis. I'm going to read this because she's a very smart lady and I don't want to get anything wrong. <laughs> Lisa has been an educator for over 10 years. She enjoys studying and after completing two bachelors of health science in natural medicine and myotherapy, she went on to study a master of preventative medicine, a master of clinical research and a graduate certificate in chronic condition management. She is a director of the Myotherapy Association of Australia and is the current convener for the Victorian Massage and Myotherapy Network, a group of RTO educators who meet regularly to discuss issues and share resources related to training and education within the massage industry. Please welcome Lisa to the stage for her presentation, Patient Engagement, a new name for old tools. Where's my clicker? Ah, oh, clicker. Sweet. Clicker. Hello. Can you hear me? Not quite? Thank you. They're looking after me. That's better. Hi. So look, apart from that, yeah, I love study. I really do. There's so much out there to know. There's so much out there to learn. Um, it's a really great way for me to use my, my um, PD stuff wisely. Um, so I get into something. Leon Chato once said that he'd written so many books because he wanted to know something. So he just put it into a book form. And I think that's kind of a bit where I've gone to, which is what this is. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to be here. I've been a bit nervous about it, um, but I'll hit my stride soon, so bear with me. Um, people here have been just lovely and so welcoming. And when we talk about care, that's part of it too, that everyone has been very much um, inclusive and sharing. And funnily enough, some of the things that I've got in my slides have been things that have been mentioned already this morning. So I feel like we're all on the same page and that's a really nice feeling when you get here and you think, yeah, they'll get me. I think they'll get me. So a lot of what I've studied has sort of led to this. There's bits and pieces from every course that you do, uh, every type of communication that you have with people that is an engaging process. Um, particularly the chronic condition management, where people have that long-term thing going on, there's self-management strategies that the engagement part feeds into. So we'll talk a bit through some of these. So we're talking about patient engagement, a new name for old tools. So before we get too far into it, I want you guys to think about how you heard about the conference. And we'll come back to this, so I want you to be thinking about why, why I'm asking this. So how did you hear about the conference? And why did you decide to attend? It can't just be for PD. Uh, did you decide straight away, or did it take you a bit of time before you thought, yeah, I'll commit now, yeah, I'm going? And what influenced your decisions? Because there's lots of things that help you decide to be here or not. Um, particularly for me, it's Rebecca. Yeah, I think she talked me down eventually. She did ask me for last year, and nerves got the better of me. <laughs> sort of backed away from that. When she asked again, I felt, yeah, I really sort of should commit to this. So um, being that it was Canberra and it's such a lovely place, I thought, yeah, this is a, a great place for me to be, great place for me to talk to you guys. Um, and yeah, so it did take me a year. Um, decisions, <laughs> decisions, well, the influencing things were obviously Rebecca, but I had this thing that had been buzzing around the back of my head and that was about patient engagement, because it's the buzzword. It's the thing that's out there at the moment that everyone's talking about and no one's really kind of put down to a definition. Um, so I thought, great, I've got something to talk about. And, you know, started talking to my family about it. I'm going to do this and I'm going to talk to people about patient engagement. And God love you, grandmothers. Um, that's not really my cup of tea. And I'm like, oh, crap. Like, what if I'm not your cup of tea? What if my talk about engagement isn't engaging. So I figure, well, there'll be something that you'll take home from this regardless. There'll be something that you find you can either add to your clinic or your clinical work, or perhaps just at the end of this, you get a cup of tea. So <laughs> bear with me. So of course, being that, we'll talk about what patient engagement is. There's a really cute little definition, and I've stuck with the one rather than give you several. There's a lot more information coming out about this at the moment. So if you find another great definition or if you want to synthesise a few, go with it. Um, we work out why you would do it, how you would do it, when you would do it, which is 
pretty much all the time. Um, how do you know if it's working? And as you can tell, there'll be references to T. So as marvellous as it sounds as a single concept of patient engagement, there's lots of things that we put together. It's not just one thing that we do. It's the communication, it's the caring. Uh, it, we talk about lots of different things, putting patient-centred care. And I think that's where we, you sort of start to talk about, um, I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the lady at the back that was talking. She was talking about things being patient-centred, taking that information back to her patients, taking things, and evidence-based practice as well, it feeds into all of that. Uh, we're going to link a bit with motivational interviewing. We're going to talk a little bit about where change management fits into that because it's all very well and good to say to someone, do it, but there's reasons why they don't. And we're going to look at the fact that some of this comes from marketing. Some of this is all about us being our marketing, our best marketing people. And hopefully we have patients who are very active at the end of this and involved and engaged. Um, so, this is the definition that I've gone with, um, Leonard Kish. So, attention, followed by an exchange of information that leads to decisions and actions towards better health and or patient-defined goals. And either way, something that they're either working towards or something that they're doing already or going to do. And that will, hopefully, come about by all of the things that happen once they get to our clinic or even into our space because of course now social media has that different, different boundary for us. We have a different boundary in our clinic. So bear with me because I would tend to talk about patients. Please feel welcome to think of them as consumers, customers, clients. However suits you, please go with it. But at any point that they've got one of these things happening down the side, uh, we've got the opportunity for engagement. And often in our clinical setting, it isn't just that thing that we're doing to them, it is that thing that we're sharing with them. So these things are going to be quite important to them and they will share them with us. So given that, they do make decisions and they will make decisions about treatment and they will make decisions about their healthcare. And those things, listed there, have a really big influence on them. And technical, technological stuff, whether that be your social medias, uh, whether that be Dr. Google, Dr. Google's always really helpful in deciding whether you're going to get treatment or whether you're going to pursue a type of treatment, or actually whether you're, you have arthritis or something worse. You know, uh, My dad was quite convinced that his elbow pain was arthritis. It's, it's arthritis, it's dreadful, um, except it was just a little bit of extensive tendonitis, sort of. Not, not really as bad as he thought. Uh, but there's always things in this that we pay off against each other. So it may be that we're willing to spend $5 more to do something closer to us, or it may be that we find that we don't want to go as far. The risks and benefits of all of those, we weigh up against each other all the time. Um, social stuff, we look at our network. We look at the people around us. We, we want to know what the champions are doing. We want to know what the trends are, and that will influence how we make decisions as well. And to a greater or lesser extent, depending on our other needs being met, which we'll talk about, and our stage of behaviour change, which we'll talk about a bit. Okay, so a couple of aspects of patient engage engagement that will feed into what you're doing. And our business owners and operators tend to make that really great first impression. And these days, we tend to have as I said, the clinic sort of, it doesn't stop at the door anymore. We have this presence that's out there. And it really does need to have a, a purpose with it. And I know that we can employ social media experts, um, but if you're just doing this in your own space, consider that some of these things may help uh, create that first impression that counts. So your message should be really consistent, and that's your branding that includes the colour and font. Um, think about Coca-Cola, they've gone back to some of their really simple branding. It's much more recognisable for them. If I mention Australia Post, I'm pretty sure that people are starting to think of red with a P symbol on it, those sorts of things. And it's recognisable and it's really, really important that what people are seeing reminds them of you. 
Um, so the messages that you use, you can send out campaigns and they can be something that has a, a thing that you keep sending the same message and that's really great for a period of time and you can change those. You repeat them and you put them on different platforms. So if you've got a blog, if you've got a Facebook, if you've got a Twitter, um, what have I missed with those? All of the other social media options, use them, use them well. Um, tailor the message slightly to fit those platforms or to fit the people who might be using those. Frequent and with different timing. That tends to be how they talk about it. Something that will get you out there and probably hitting people when they're available to receive the message as well. Um, I know I tend to lose some of my Facebook messages or you know, some, some of my friends networking things. They sort of fall down the chain. So if I'm there when it first comes up, great, I see what's happening. But you'd want to be getting people when they're ready to receive the message. And think about your identity. You need to have a consistent identity when you're putting information up there. Um, you want it to be something that's relevant to your business. And it meets with your uh, goals, it meets with your mission statement, your business plan, something that gives you that really great connection. People want to have something that's consistent in the way that your business runs. They tend to get a bit odd when you, when you put up your uh, LOL cats in the, right in the middle of your massage blog. I don't know, freaks them out. Um, perception should be that you've got a premium business, that you are the go-to place for information, for care, and anything else that you can provide. You are the resource for them. And as always, goes without saying, think before posting. Um, people, <laughs> it's their right to take offence, and they will. Uh, but just keep in mind that, that sometimes our wording can be gentler. So social media, it reaches a wider audience, and that's what we love. Rebecca was talking, and Michelle were talking about the network that you've got, and it's Australia-wide, and that's exciting and there's different things happening in different places. So we can use that to our advantage. That networking can be forums, it can be um, different types of groups that get together. Those communities of practice are vital, particularly in this profession where we have things that are happening and growing and changing. Um, having that united front or that private army that Rebecca's calling to arms is really, really important. So we can have sections on our social media that talk about you know, that, that getting people in. Is it normal? People want to know, is it, is it normal to have this pain in my elbow? Um, or is it arthritis? Um, they want to be able to have a testimony. They want to be able to talk. They want to get into that forum space and share. Lots of sharing. Um, they, want, they want to be, you want to be able to coach and mentor people. And social media gets you that in a bigger way. You can provide little tips and tricks to a lot of people all at once. And information. What a great place to put some of your information. I've seen some really great um, live video on, on Facebook recently with people doing exercises, uh, demonstrating things. It stopped just being a word or a picture and it's starting to move a bit more into that really interactive space. And that gives you the opportunity to get your people active as well. And Sometimes it's not just us that has that information to hand. Sometimes it's really great to be able to piggyback off someone else's information and link to their information. It's okay, you don't have to do it all by yourself. I know uh, Aaron has some really great stuff and Michelle. Um, you'll see some of them in action later. But certainly if I was going to you know, talk about anything, I don't know, mental health network in the last couple of weeks, um, I would be looking for things that came from um, Beyond Blue or places that have a lot that they're putting out at that time as well. So it's a really great opportunity to share that and piggyback off those. You don't have to do all the hard work. Don't work harder, just work smarter. Um, and the best thing about social media is we can measure it. Um, there's a lot of analysis tools within it, particularly at the back end of Facebook. Now, not an expert by any means, I just know that it's there. And you can see what people are doing. You can see whether they're liking something, whether they're reading something, whether they're clicking through to an article, and how long they spend in those spaces. So if you're using those tools, if you get a chance to look at them and, and use them well, you'll see where people are engaging with the business. And that's more than just a click on, or a like. Look for opportunities for engagement. Don't just change the like, chase the likes. So the types of messages that we put out there 
may change how people interact with your sites or how they interact with your association. Uh, we want push messages out there. We want people to be aware. They're your newsletters, your texts, the information that you are putting out there. It's very baseline. It's very much like, here, here's something for you. Great. And the pull messages will be the ones that bring people in. They draw people closer to you. So they're, they're advertising, they're promotions, they might be a 20% off, they might be a two for one, they might be a bring a friend, they might be just a little bit about, you know, update your information with us, uh, those sorts of things. But it's that relationship management side of it that really helps when you're giving messages to people and getting them closer to you. Now, facilitated users, they're more about getting people active and involved in what you're doing. Something like a little private army. Okay, so it's shooting down those people that are saying that massage isn't meant to be up here. It's that private army. So you've had a call to arms this morning. You know what needs to be. <laughs> Rebecca's going, yes! Um, you know what needs to happen. And I'm hoping that you are all facilitated users because your profession needs each and every one of you. If I was just presenting to one person here, that'd be fine. But how exciting that we've got 100 people that are going to take this whole message out there into the big wide world. I think it's really important that we can stand together and we can do that together. Other things that we can do, exchange information. And that's great um, if we want a bit more what's happening for you, those sorts of things. We've got that networking available with news forums. We get our communities of practice going. And when you're talking about things that are being discussed on the blogs or on the Facebook page, that's what you guys are doing. You've got this community of practice that's working so well. Um, you've got that chance to talk to someone who's in Melbourne or, or somewhere else in, in the country and, and know how things are working for them. Um, we certainly know that, that things that happen in Melbourne aren't the same as things that happen anywhere up the coast or across the country. So those communities of practice become far more valuable when you're looking at them on social media. Um, it does give you the opportunity for question and answers or frequently asked questions and also surveys. Surveys are a great way to get an idea of where people are at the moment and uh, possibly where they're going to. So it's not always just us, is it? Sometimes it's the team. Um, and we are more than just a computer presence. There's more to us than that. And as I said, once we get to the clinic door, then things really start to happen for us. So we need to create a culture of engagement. It's not just one person that does it. It's not just the person on the computer. It's not just the person in the consultation room. And it's not just the person at the desk. It's everybody in the place speaking the same thing. Uh, we want everyone to have the same communication strategies or an empowering language. Um, some really great examples of, of communication styles that are out there. Um, I'm sure people have seen in a waiting room the really busy registrar who comes out and just goes, Michelle, and wanders off down the hallway. And goodness me, there's 16 doors out there and I don't know where I'm going. I'm still packing my knitting away. And, and, uh, and I don't feel like... I feel like I've started off on the wrong foot already. I really feel like I, now I'm already chasing and, and, I, and I'm not ready for this. Um, whereas what we've been talking to some of the students about is that really good communication from the start and that care, that communication is the most important thing. It sets the tone for how things are going to go. If I stand here and I say, Michelle, and Michelle says, hi, it's me. Hello, I'm Lisa. I'll be treating you today. We're heading down here. We're in room three. It's on the right. As you go in there, just pop your bags on the side there and I'll get you to sit in the chair by the door. And it's far more communicating, far better communication than, than just being too busy to engage with them. It's really, really important. But it's not just us, obviously. It's the people at the desk or the people who service all of the other aspects of that. Sometimes that is us. Sometimes we are the person at the desk as well. Totally appreciate that. Um, it may be that some of the other things that we can do with them really set that tone as well. So we want people to be able to set goals and make decisions, and we want to support them with that. And sometimes it's about giving them that 10-minute space 
sometimes it's about providing other information for them and evidence-based practice certainly helps feed into that, um, giving them the best available information to make some decisions. Um, Follow-ups, reminders, flags, coaching, checklists, a lot of those are in the computer side of things. Um, interesting things that I've come across as far as really good communication and information. Arriving somewhere that has no parking. Gosh darn it, why didn't you tell me? Uh, got to a place uh, to have a meeting and tried the door and it was locked. Uh, this was in a university space and tried the door was locked. So I sat down outside the door and waited and waited. And I was early, so I figured, that's all right, they'll meet me here. What I didn't know was there was another door that went around the other side and this person was, had gone in that way and was waiting inside the door, expecting me to be pounding on the door. Again, communication could have solved some of these issues. So sometimes we could think about things like if you've got an initial patient, sending out a NFAQ straight away. So, hi, I'll be coming for my first visit on Friday. Great, what's your email address? There's a few things you need to know. How to find us, what, what cash or cards we accept, um, some of those sorts of things. And it sets the tone. The communication is there right up and early. And it really does give you the opportunity to get to know the business. And the more that we get to know the business, the more that we feel like we're part of it. Uh, we took our little fluffy dog, Sheedy. He's an Essendon supporter. Uh, we took him to the vet at 1.30 in the morning, uh, the emergency. And he was not in a good way, and he's fine. Uh, but when we got there, they were very welcoming. They took really good care of him. Um, he perked up straight away because I think he just needed better attention. And, and, you know, we took him home and looked after him for a couple of days and he was great. But the next day, our usual vet, who we'd recently changed to, rang us and said, how is he? Is there anything you need from us? Any questions? Do you need any follow-up? What can we do for you? And the emergency place that we were at rang us and said, is there anything you need? Do you need a follow-up? Uh, we've let your vet know. We're sorted. The place that we used to go to before we met these beautiful vets and emergency services referred to when we said, oh, he throws up a bit every so often, just, the nurse said, yeah, fluffies do that. But I'm sorry, I, the language just wasn't empowering there for me in that moment. Um, and my poor little puppy dog, who means the world to me, he's my fur baby, um, it really didn't make me feel like I was part of their team. It really polarised for me. And I think that feeling of belonging is sort of what we want to create for our patients, clients, customers. Um, coordinated care doesn't just have to be something that happens once people have a big uh, disease or a big thing. It can be that we refer within our clinic. Um, I'm certain that you guys that are working in multidisciplinary places have people that perhaps we can share with. And maybe we use those pull messages to get them business and they get us business. Um, we can use, certainly use people like PTs, we can use people who are uh, doing stretch classes, uh, meditation. We know that some of these things will help people um, in their whole overall wellness. It's, it's not just us that does something. Um, but there's also more in the community. And it may depend on your target audience or your target group if you have one. It may depend where you work from. There are places where, unfortunately, the therapist or the, the um, office staff do need to ask, do you have somewhere to live this week? Or do you have something to eat? Um, and so knowing where you could refer people, if, you, if your target group is like that, and we do have places in, in Melbourne where uh, people are working out of Sacred Heart and places like that. And they are asking those sorts of questions on a regular basis. And they do need to know how to get those people involved and keep them well and safe. Um, so coordinating care is a bit about that. And again, the same language, having the same information and being able to share it really, really well. Um, educational outreach sounds really awesome. It's about giving talk, it's, it's about sharing, it's about telling people about what you do and how you do it. Um, and I do think message is awesome for that. I do think we tend to tell people, we do tend to want to share what we do a lot. And it's great, it's really great. Um, but we can improve people's health literacy. 
and that language that they use is really, really important. There's a, another word going around at the moment called nocebo, and it's using language that's detrimental to people's health. It's not supporting what we're doing at all. It's telling people they have a weak back or um, a bad back or such, and that can have really devastating results. Um, when people hear that, take that on and go with it. So I can't do things because I have a bad back. I can't do anything that requires strength because I have a weak back. So again, language matters and we use it, we use it well, it helps. Uh, we can get into the research space and Rebecca's certainly a really great person for you in that regard too. Um, knowing that your people are being um, either utilised well for research or being included in research, and that's a big part of the ethics of research, in inclusiveness. So if you do have a target group, representing them in, in research results really helps them uh, when we need to advocate for them in governments or in settings where they've got um, less voice. So again, they might be the one person standing up there saying, help, I need something from TAC or NDIS or from the doctor, but we can add your voice to it and we can add a hundred more voices to it today. And that makes it really important. And helping to represent people is a really great way of engaging them. They feel like we care. And as Derek said, that's, that's at the essence for us. So back to our little check-in. Um, what types of messages did you get about the conference? When I asked you about whether you decided to be here or straight away or did you decide later or did you get a couple of push messages, a bit more information, yeah, some pull messages, so we're starting to get you in, maybe some incentives, a bit of interest, yeah, okay. Um, so it obviously met your needs at some point. There was stuff there that, that we got out to you that you, it created a bit of an interest, a bit of a vibe, and you made a decision, and the action is that you're here. Um, have a think about some of those influences too. I'm, I'm guessing that um, you know financial, geographical, um, technological, those sorts of things. I like that we've got a presence here, and we're not just on the web. Hi. Um, because I heard something this week from, uh, there was a blog called The Research Whisperer, and they're fantastic if you're looking at um, being in that research space, often they feel quite isolated. Um, but they were saying, particularly talking about conferences and were they going the way of the dodo, you know, were they basically becoming outdated because apparently, who knew, people enjoyed the morning tea part of it and the lunch part of it for the networking often more than they get engaged with the speakers. No. No. <laughs> That's my back. Uh, but I actually thought, well, I get what they're saying. Maybe we could just webinar everything and, and just have you know, people buy in from everywhere. But it doesn't really give you that same kind of you know, thing. It's that being here one-on-one -on -one where you do get the chance to talk. And you get the chance to talk about the person who is just on, and you get the chance to participate in the workshops. And knowing, getting that feedback of whether your touch is right or whether your pressure's okay is really important. And as much as we can do simulated um, projects as much as we want, we, we still haven't quite perfected the way of getting that information back. So a lot of those sorts of things may have fed back into your influencing. Um, we do like that there's a lot of influences in decision making. And we can, we can influence those slightly, but it's also a sales pitch. <laughs> this comes from sales, marketing, um, that it sort of feeds the same sort of information. And as I said, this is pretty much a patient engagement. And so in a way, we're selling, but we're not really upselling. We're not really pushing as hard. So for the people who are not always the business side of it, who are in the consultation space. This bit is all about you. Or actually it's not. Because patient engagement is actually about patient-centered treatment. And some of this will get a little bit bogged down. Some of it's gonna get a little bit like, oh yes, but I already know that, I do that. That's okay, because we're gonna put a lots of things together. So informed consent 
it's a big part of what we do. It's really important. It's legal, it's ethical, it's all of the nice things. But informed consent, not just can I do this, yeah, because not so informed. Um, so we like autonomy. We like that the person gets to make a decision. And they have a right to that. They want us to do the right thing for them and they want the right to be dignified, um, respected, supported in that decision. So autonomy becomes really important to them. I will continue on that theme. Um, it requires a really good dialogue. And that's about us communicating where we're coming from and them communicating where they're coming from. Because if they're just getting something done to them, it stops that care. It really does. It's, it's much better when we're engaging with them and involved with them. Uh, and we get to the valid consent once everyone gets on the same page. So valid consent, or any type of consent, mind you, can be thought of as a cup of tea. Yes, another one. Uh, so I can't force you to have a cup of tea. I won't force you to have a cup of tea. That would be wrong. Um, if you say, yeah, sure, I want a cup of tea now, it doesn't mean you have to have that cup of tea when I bring it. Um, it doesn't mean that, that you, know, you can say no or you, know, you can say yes later. It's OK. If you said yes last week, you don't have to say yes this week. It's completely OK. It's your cup of tea. Um, particularly also, the act that is performed is what was consented to. Did you want white with one? I'm going to give you peppermint because I think people need peppermint in their lives. It's really, really important. Um, and we do get that a little bit in the student clinics. It's something we sort of go, whoa, big no-no. Um, yeah, maybe people do need to, or do like to have their back massaged as well. But if that's not what they consented to, please don't just throw it in there because there's some really nasty consequences, which we'll get to. Um, so we do know that it needs to be a competent person. But we also know that they need to know what's going on. Um, it's all very well and good to say, yes, we all feel like we're competent people to make decisions, but if we haven't got that information, it's really, really difficult to make an informed decision. So the nature and effect of what's going on. We perform the assessment and we give them results or we talk to them about the outcomes and we talk to them about what we could do and what the risks and benefits of that might be whether we do it or don't do it. Um, and that allows them to decide, and it's all about decisions. So obviously, if we don't get this right, there's a couple of different ways that the patient may take this. Trespass or negligence. And we need to explain to the patient, have them understand what the treatment will be, how it will likely affect them for good or for bad. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, they it, we have to scare them into anything or scare them away from anything. It's just putting the options out there for them. However, saying that, keep in mind that if you ask an eight-year-old what they want to wear, it will take them half an hour. If you ask them whether they want the red one or the blue one, you've, you've narrowed down their options. So perhaps provide them the best available options. And this is evidence-based practice. We, apart from trespass, we have negligence, and they must be made aware of the material risks. And they're things that you know or should know could happen to this person or someone very much like them, or they could be significant to them. Um, it's easy to use the example of, you know, cupping on a supermodel and they then couldn't work because of, of that and, you know, it's terrible to them. Um, it sort of does feed into it really well. It gives you that example. Negligence means that we have a duty of care to them, that it was breached and harm occurred. But apart from that, if we don't give them adequate information, the right information, evidence-based information, um, it actually feeds into that negligence space as well. And we're better than that. We know better than that. So again, back to the evidence-based practice thing, because I do like it. Um, we use the best available external evidence. So if there's systematic reviews, if there's research out there that, we, that supports someone who, well, generally we want the research to be on someone who is very similar to our patient. We want to be able to apply it properly. Um, we use the best available evidence 
to our clinic. So we want something that we know we're confident and capable of doing. And we also want something that perhaps our clinic area supports. Um, as I said, we're, we're all working in different spaces with a different target audience. And so when we've got those uh, groups that, are, that need more or need less, we can probably tailor our stuff to that. And we also like, this is Dolligan's bit that he adds in, um, best available evidence concerning the preferences of a fully informed patient. And just keep saying it, fully informed. It means that they know all the stuff that's going on and it still takes into account their values, beliefs, expectations as being really important to it. And that's that decision-making space that they've got and that negotiation that we're part of. So this is from counselling. This is patients into therapy, a bit different to practice. Um, but it is about that listening, communication, talking, um, helping reframe for them, so reflecting back. What is it that's going on for you? Hey, you know, I hear that you don't have somewhere to live this week. Can I help you with that? Um, I hear that your shoulder's really frustrating you, um, that you can't play tennis. You know, what sort of things can we do to help you with that? Is it the pain that's a problem? Is it the movement that's a problem? These are questions that you're asking, but it's just giving you examples. Um, so pretty much, we want to be clear, clarified with them because sometimes we have to be really present um, and we need to know what's going on for them. I did have one teacher who, a while ago when I studied, um, who was very much like, locuming for someone else. I don't really like that patient group. They want to talk to me. But, well, that's kind of the idea, isn't it? Um, and even if we've done the assessment part of it, or you know, negotiated consent with them, there's other things that they tell you, other things that they share, which become important to this. It's not just their physical part, it's also their mental part. And giving them the opportunity to debrief on some of the things that have contributed to their pain are really, really important. Um, so finding out what's happening for them at any point is really part of what we're doing. So um, we get this a bit too, particularly with the student groups. So in session one, here's your exercises. I've got this treatment plan for you. I've sussed it all out. Off you go. And when the person comes back, they haven't done it. Well, why not? You, you really have to do it. It's part of your treatment plan and it's really important. It's a really good treatment plan. I wrote it. Um, it's sort of not as patient-centred as we could be. I think when we negotiate consent, we also need to negotiate the treatment plans and think about where things fit in. Um, it needs to be their goal. It needs to be something that they're excited about doing and involved in doing. And we have some great ways of getting them to sort this out. But it may be at the moment that the message that we're trying to give them doesn't really fit in with their stage of change. So pre-contemplation, where I'm not even thinking about doing something, contemplation means, yeah, I'm starting to think about doing, you know, maybe getting a bit of exercise stuff. Preparation, bought new runners. Oh, actually, that's where it stops for my grandmother, by the way. Bought new runners. They don't go running by themselves. Who knew? Uh, action. So we've started a walking plan. Um, maintenance will just be tweaking it so that it fits, continuously fits. It's sustainable. Relapse. We have relapses. It's normal. Sometimes our behaviours aren't always you know, going in the same direction. And again, all of those influences that we talked about um, are going to be something that, that impacts that. And um, not to mention, we haven't even talked about you know, family and friends and work. Um, and I certainly appreciate that the hours that people in this room would work aren't always conducive to getting out there and exercising um, after work. So when we're trying to talk to someone about where they're going to exercise or when they're going to exercise or any part of their treatment plan for that matter, we need to know that it fits in here, okay? Um, because if I'm not really thinking about doing any exercise, giving me a 16-week exercise program really isn't going to buzz my buttons. It's not going to get me active. So 
as we talk about that, think about this. Pretty much, if I was just pre-contemplation, you can give me a bit more information, a bit more about, hey, this is why exercise is good for you, but there's no point pushing the physical part of it. I'm really not up to that yet. Some of the other points here, we can interact with and we can get really great results out of it. But yeah, we want to make sure that, that we're fitting in with where they're at right now. So motivational interviewing is a really great way of doing that. This gets down to the nitty gritty of why or how they're going to do things. Um, it helps, with them, helps them with goal setting. It's a style of counselling. Um, it identifies their barriers, and that's obviously important. Um, if I'm sort of thinking, great, you've got this plan and you're going to go out and exercise, but no, you haven't got housing or something like that, I can find out quite quickly and quite easily um, by checking in with you and finding out what's going on. Um, it helps them link the problem and the solution together. It, it, you know, this is where you want to be and this is where you are now. What are the steps we can do to get there? Instead of just, you need to be here, go for it. Um, it's really patient-centred because it's all about them. They get to make a lot of the decisions. They get to hear their own voice. So important. Um, it fits in with their values then and it helps improve their compliance, oddly enough, because they chose to do it and they chose when and how. Um, and it will definitely improve their confidence that it's part of what they decided. And it's empowering, as we said. Um, it can be a little bit challenging to them because we are asking them to do it, but we can support them through this. So it's about providing empathy. It's about understanding where people are coming from. Um, if we don't know that, we're often trying to slap that training thing on them if really they're only up to a stretching point. Um, it's important to make them the match. We want to just develop that discrepancy. This is where you are. This is what your assessment results showed me. This is perhaps where you might be, for want of a better word, weak in this shoulder. But we can work through and get you strong in about six weeks or so. Um, so this is where you are. This is where you want to be. Um, and we can make sure that, that they understand that that discrepancy isn't there. It's that behaviour change that we want to see. So what is it that you're going to do from here to here to make that happen? And it may be that they need to make contact with people. It may be that they need to get out there and move. Um, it's a bigger process. Um, we want to hear them starting to make self-motivational statements. Yeah, I think that's possible. I could, I could probably do that. There's a chance that, yeah, I, I reckon I've got an option for me. I can do something with it. And once we start hearing that, we can really work with them. Now, there will be resistance. People will have all of the, like, no, 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 because, but ifs, but what's. And that's OK. We either avoid it, we change the focus, or we roll with it. And ors, we'll talk about in a sec, we'll feed into it. So resistance comes because we're not at the right stage of change. We're not ready to do it now. We might be ready later, but right now we don't want to hear it. We might be, <sighs> there might be a reason why we need to stay exactly where we are right now. Um, the therapist may not see that, but, but as a patient, I'm really comfy in my little space and there's no reason for me to change. It's working for me. Um, there may be a whole stack of other things that factor into it. And that's why we do this process. We try and get to the bottom of that, try and work out what the problems are so we can overcome them. Um, maybe they don't really see it as an issue. And that's OK. But there's got to be a point where they see that what they're doing right now isn't reducing harm. Maybe it's creating harm. So we can reduce that resistance by being empathetic, you know, understanding that, yeah, it's been hard for you. You know, is there something that we can change about that? Change the focus. So when they're telling you that, you know, that's not the issue, it's not why I'm here, um, that's okay. We'll talk about that in a sec. We'll come back to it and we'll circle around. There's other things that we can talk to them about. We don't have to engage them on a hostile 
element. Um, it is their choice. It's their control. Keep them involved in that. Keep them active in that, in that space. We'll summarise it, give it to them in a nice, neat little package. But we're also not going to rescue them every time. But we're going to be a great resource for them. And that's so important. Every time they have a question or they need some treatment or they need a bit more information, we can be that person for them. We're just not going to dig them out of the hole if they keep getting down there. So, back to the oars. Ask them open-ended questions. What's going on for them? You know, it's when we get to those really close questions, we start locking down options. And they don't really tend to share bigger stories. It tends to be very much yes and no. So ask open-ended questions. Get them sharing information. And affirmations. You know, it sounds like you're doing a really great job with that. It sounds like you guys are really practicing great care. I want you to keep going with it. I think you can do it. You're doing well. Keep it up. It's not much, but it's really nice to hear it, isn't it? That someone's, you know, acknowledging what you're doing already as being important. Um, we'll reflect back to them. I'm hearing that it's hard. I realise that there's some things you need to overcome, but I think you can do it. And we'll summarise it again, pop it into that nice little package. This is where you are, this is where you're going, and this is what you've said can happen. Let's do it. So we use the final technique. It's a bit like playing a big game of guess who. So you've got all these little people in front of you and you're asking questions and we want to know, you know, is it something to do with your shoulder? Yes, great. So we flip down everything that's not a shoulder. It's our assessment process in general. Um, but we're narrowing it down, narrowing it down. So as I said, the assessment process, I've got pain. It's in my left shoulder. It hurts on uh, resisted external rotation. I have tenderness to palpation. Right about here. Oh, well, we've gone from I'm just a person to now having a really clear idea of where we're going. That can happen too with anything else that we're talking about with treatments. Um, I'll go back to an exercise idea because that works quite well. Um, people will tell you that they used to exercise and they'd really like to do some exercise. Okay, well, I I'd like to do some exercise. I used to do some exercise. What type of exercise did you do? Well, I really liked something that was fairly small. I'm not really good at running on surfaces and things like that. I don't really like gyms. I really enjoyed yoga once, but I haven't been back for a while. Is there a yoga place near you? Do you have someone that you can go to yoga with? And we've got it down to that. If you think about uh, any decisions that you've made, often it does that. We've got that really great funnel. And as I said, it's like a big game of guess who. And each time you ask a question, you're getting some of those little points down and to have just got that one little solution at the end. And if they're saying these things, they're hearing their own voice, which is really, really important. Now, we do know, as I said, that we've got um, an hierarchy of needs. Um, they're your social determinants of health as well. So it's going to be really hard for someone to, as I said, get active and get physical and go out and do things if they don't have all of these things being met along the way. So definitely ask, definitely get them to share. If there is something that's far more pressing than them doing you know, five squats while they answer the phone or something along those lines. Um, we're less likely to accept facts. We're less likely to be self-aware. If we're really struggling with food insecurity or housing or you know, if our relationship is falling down, we don't prioritise things, we don't make them important um, if we're dealing with this sort of stuff down here. So making sure that we can meet those needs for people first, their basic needs, is really important. So some of the tips for when you're dealing with people is collaborate and negotiate. It's a dialogue, not a monologue. Uh, getting them talking. Let them hear their voice, as we keep saying. Um, don't assume for good or bad. Because someone's in their gym clothes doesn't mean they're going to the gym. It may just mean they're going for latte or tea. Um, it's normal to have highs and lows in your motivation. It's really hard to stay on that track. But 
you hear it in uh, smoking cessation, they talk about it a lot in those types of promotional ads for the quit line. I tried before, but this time I can do better. And that's where we come in. We're, we're providing those like get up and go again kind of uh, information. So we want them to be, it's okay, get back on track, get back to your exercise, get back to your meditation. You're here for dealing with your stress. Let's work on that. We know for sure that hearing their own voice is important. I've, you've heard my voice and it feels good to me. <laughs> Do they acknowledge that there is a problem at all? Um, Sometimes they're not linking it up. They don't see that, uh, you know, the type of work that they're doing or their seat, sitting position or having their wallet in their back pocket is even the issue. They don't see it. They don't put it together. If they do, are they concerned enough to make a change? It's not all, I mean, you know, go and do some exercise. <laughs> yeah, whatever. It's not always enough to just have that. And we can do some brief interventions that will help. And it doesn't have to be a whole consultation around this. It can be just five minutes. So, because we're all about the tea, how important right now is getting a cup of tea to you? Think about it, one to 10, so important? Yeah. Great, I have a 10, I don't even need to worry about it. Beck's a 10, right now I'm probably like, I'm about a nine, because I'm thinking I need a glass of water first, but that will feed back into that. Uh, how confident are you about getting it? Well, considering I'm at this end of the room, morning teas after my session, by the time I step off here, grab my bag, I've got 100 people getting out there. So, <laughs> gonna have to use elbows. Uh, it's, so, confidence-wise, I'm hoping that you guys just leave me at least one cup of tea. Um, maybe at the moment I'm about a four. If I can just uh, get you guys all to sit and meditate for five minutes when I finish, I'll be the first one out there. Yes. Uh, so, Think about why you might have scored yourself so low or so high. Having a lack of tea right now may not even be the problem for you. I mean, maybe you prefer coffee or maybe you're not thinking about the white and one. Maybe you are thinking about that peppermint tea. And that's going to change for everybody. Knowing what I want or what you want is going to be the important factor. Um, so think about it in a clinical setting. How high or low would you need to be to change your mind or change your behaviour or your patient need to be to change their mind or behaviour. So when it comes to daily stretching, how important is it to me? How confident am I that I can do it? Or exercising, how important is it to me? How confident am I that I can do it? Because yeah, it's really important. We did a, an exercise in uh, the the chronic condition self-management along these sorts of lines. So you, you need to set a goal. Okay, well, great. I need to exercise, I need to lose weight. Um, oh, and there are angels in the world. <laughs> Thank you, gorgeous. God bless tea. her. No, but there will be tea and that's a good thing. Um, yeah, but if you're, so they told us we had to set a goal. So yes, I would like to exercise. I have put on a couple of kilos, let's get rid of those. We had to check in with someone, which was awesome, um, but didn't exercise, not even once. Because I got told I had to have a goal, got told I had to do something. Can't tell me what to do. So it's important that it really does come from within. And it did nothing, did nothing. Didn't lose weight, didn't do anything. It's like, meh, can't tell me what to do. Um, even though I need to, I just didn't. And it's, that's the same with your people. I mean, I realized when I provided the feedback on the exercise, I said, this is typical of this type of thing, when it's forced on you, when it's a you have to, rather than, yeah, I want to, I will. It's a really different experience. So, with our people, we explore the pros and cons. Yeah, okay, let's have a think about exercising in winter. <laughs> Screw that. No, I don't want to exercise in winter. It really doesn't work for me. It's cold, it's dark. I don't like rain, I don't like being wet. Uh, it's a concern because there's safety factors that, that concern me. Um, good, bad, balance, likely to change? Yeah, all right, we've got spring, we've got summer, and we've got great things like daylight savings in Melbourne. Um, so we get out there more. At that time of day, it feels like we can, you know, exercise more, more often. It feels great to be out and doing it. The pros are that I'm getting, you know, sunlight, exercise, walking the dog, doing all those sorts of great things. It's, it's working for me already. 
I've developed that discrepancy. I have that, I need to lose weight because, yeah, if I'm going to get married in February, I really do need to fit into a dress that I'm choosing. So my behaviour needs to change for that. So I've got my motivation and I'm pretty motivated to do it. It's pretty important. It's up there. And I reckon I can do it now that daylight savings here. Do you reckon I can do it? Yeah. I'm getting some affirmations. I'm loving it already. So I've summarised it and now I have a goal and I'm going to action. Well, I hope I am. So a few more confidence boosters would have been nice, but you don't know me. So previous experience, and we talked about that smoking cessation campaign. So what have you done before that, that would help you with this? And I certainly know that eating better, eating less would help. So I'm going to put that in place. And the barriers in the past, well, we're probably a bit over the winter thing. Um, I can probably manage plate size a bit better. We have a bit of an erratic schedule at home, um, shift workers and stuff. So, you know, I'm really going to get some things made up start of the week so that I can have them during the week. It works much, much better for me. Um, do I know someone who's been in the same situation? Can we apply that learning? If it's someone in your clinic that, that's talking about doing something different, whether it be, you know, trying a different technique that's been applied to them or it, whether it's doing something that's active, uh, who are their role models? Who are their champions for this? Are there, are there people that you could recommend to them as well? You know, um, Aaron was just telling me about some really great blogs out there, some really great Twitter places. And Rebecca's mentioned quite a few already this morning, talking about, you know, there's some really great people that you can get some really great examples from. And we look at our supports. So, I mean, yeah, little sheedy dog's going to come on the walks with me. But maybe I need someone else. Maybe I need to check in with Michelle. Hey, you know, I, I haven't been for a walk this week. Can I meet you at Albert Park? Let's go. It's a 5K track. Are you up for it? Or Michelle checks in with me. Have you been for that walk? What time do I need to pick you up? Come on. Let's go. So having those supports in place too. And overcoming the barriers may mean that I need to get someone to get me out of the couch. My couch is a bit of a barrier. So we use it all the time. We use it when we're treatment planning and we use it during the consent process because it's that engaging and involving part of it. It's that communication. Um, if we get people to co-sign their treatment plan, it gives them a bit more accountability. It's also something that they take home. Their treatment plan becomes their care plan. It's something that's written down for them. It's something that gives them goals to achieve before the next session. And it stops just being something that happens on a Tuesday at 1.30 when we see them. It starts being something that happens for them all week. It's an interesting way of, of dealing with that sort of thing. And I've seen it in action in um, a school uh, clinic and it worked really, really well. Um, we talk about return visits. We talk about the, the maintenance side of things. We talk about what they could do, what they've been doing. Was there something they needed to tweak to work with it? We talk about that follow-up and coaching. Social media, as I said, we can reach that bigger audience. We can send something out all week. Um, have you been doing this? Um, it doesn't take much time. Often we can preset things on social media to happen at different times. You know, if you're working on an exercise plan this week, have you done it? Do you need some help? Check in with us. Um, how's that nutrition going for you? Have you seen our nutritionist in our clinic? Um, we had that relapse discussion or that failure to launch. And as I said before, sometimes it's just that we've smashed them with an idea and they're not ready for it. And we can keep doing that sort of thing, but we want to know if it's working. And that's tricky. Because we want it to be really patient-centred, not just something that we're saying we're doing. So engaged. So as a concept, it's been around for over 100 years. Uh, we often ask people how we're doing, what's going on, we ask for feedback. Um, we may have focus groups, there's polls, there's surveys, there's research. It's part of the plan, do, study, act cycle, which most business type situations will use. Plan, do, study, act. So we're in the study part of it. And there's different areas of engagement that we'll evaluate in different ways. So we can certainly 
uh, check for satisfaction. Often at the end of your conference, you'll have a satisfaction check-in, uh, maybe at the end of a, a workshop or a training exercise, a little bit of feedback, you know, did you like the room, did you like the presenter, was it engaging? Uh, or you may have some baseline information that you want to collect from people, and that's a really great way of doing it. We can certainly see what interactions are happening, and as I said, analysing that Facebook data or seeing what's being retweeted, seeing what's being uh, accessed is a really great way of doing that. Um, likes and clicks are always awesome, but also we can see what the other stuff is going there. And maybe even seeing what, they, what people do get excited about. And if you get more likes and clicks on the LOL cats that you put on there, that's a worry. <laughs> um, we want to know about their active participation. So if you've got some type of boot camp or if you've got um, stretching classes or yoga or if you've got meditation sessions that, that are working really well in your clinic space, um, you want to know if, if those numbers are increasing. Are they getting more people involved? Are more people understanding that that's an important part of what's happening for them? Um, can you check their knowledge on it um, and see what's happening for them? Do they really have that, yeah, I know that the meditation side of it works, it decreases my blood pressure, it helps me feel centred. Um, what sort of, what can they tell you a bit more about it? So that retention side is important. But essentially, are they changing their behaviours towards more healthful uh, modes? So, to summarise, because we like a good summary, what is it we hope to see? Well, we want to see those engaged people, engaged customers, engaged clients, engaged consumers. So within the business, we want them to be aware of us. We want to be their go-to person. We want them to, to come to us for all of that information, all of that care. Um, we want them to recommend others and refer others. Um, they might like to think that we're their best kept secret, but we don't want to be that. We want to be known to absolutely everyone. Um, we want them in, back in for return visits, but we want them to have buy-in. We want them to feel like they're part of the family. Um, we want to check in with them if we haven't seen them for a while. We want to make sure that if they need that follow-up visit or that follow-up care, that, that we're there for them, you know? Um, having that follow-up call the next day for me felt really, really nice. Uh, within the consultation or within that clinic setting, we want them to have a better uptake of the services uh, because they're aware of them and they're educated. They know that it will help and they know why. Um, and they're starting to get really involved in it. They really realise that being proactive about their health and self-managing their health is working well for them. And that satisfaction, so the expectations are being met. Uh, they're not sitting there thinking, wow, you know, I, I could have got this. I could have... Oh, we've asked all the questions. We've checked in with them. We know what it is they want. And their expectations are addressed. And they feel that they've still got dignity and respect and support um, within themselves. They should feel resilient. Their coping skills should be increased. Uh, they're self-managing and they feel that empowerment. They feel that it's okay to ask a question. They feel that it's okay to check in with you, um, to feel that you know, they're in a safe space. Because our well-informed people are able to make decisions and it's a legal requirement. Um, they feel acknowledged. They feel that they're part of it. Their satisfaction's up. They're, com they're doing the compliancy, as we said. It's all, it's all about them, and they're doing it. Um, they have better outcomes because of that. And their activities and interventions match their values, their beliefs, their expectations, requirements, and their stage of change. And they feel really good about that. They're not being challenged. So patient engagement, we've provided the attention for them. We've given them information and incentives. We've given them the chance for a decision, and now they're providing the action. And all it took was the application of a few of these principles. So whether it's a new name for old tools or an old concept using a new name, you're still finding that you guys are probably doing a lot of it. You can just link it up just a little bit more and make it something that's all about them. So remember, we get one more T reference, and that's it. Thank you so much for having me, Canberra. It's been a ball.